today I want to share with you how I take my clay sculptures like this Oni demon here and actually digitize them to turn them into a digital file, which I then use later on for molding and casting, not through traditional means, but through 3D printing in resin. You see, this process is called photogrammetry. And I use this program called 3DF Zephyr. What makes it very interesting is that I'm able to take 80 to 100 pictures of the same sculpture from different angles. And through using this process that you're watching me do here, I'm actually able to create a 3D model from it, which requires minimal 3D modeling in order to turn into a 3D printable file. There's actually a lot of tutorials online on how to use this program, which I'll have pop up on the video right now. And I'll put a link in the description of the one that actually taught me how to use this software. But the thing that I had to learn for myself is how to 3D scan complex models like this humanoid figure of the Oni Demon. You'll notice that what I'm doing here is drawing some sort of weird blue and red lines all over this picture and other pictures of the sculpture. One thing to keep in mind is that these AI programs are not 100% accurate at this point. So what needs to happen is you need to actually tell the program what part of the image is the model that you want to turn into a 3D representation and what part of the image is background noise. So this is a masking technique. You can think of it in very analog terms as using blue masking tape when you're going to spray paint a model or a painting or even your walls. So what I'm doing is I'm using all of these blue marks here that you're seeing in order to check off the background and also the base of the sculpture. Then I'm using the red lines as a through line to indicate to the program exactly what is part of the sculpture. Now you'll notice here Shadow lines don't always get picked up 100%. So you may have to do some internal um, maneuvering there. Usually it comes out pretty good, but the problem is, the tedious part, is that for one sculpture to get a good scan, you're talking about 80 images. I'm moving pretty quickly here. At this point in the recording, I had warmed up and already gotten through about half of the masks. You'll see that I use a larger brush to save my wrist and my hand. And then I switch to a smaller brush in order to get smaller details of the background or the figure itself. Small voids like holes in a cape or the tiny gap angles between the arms and a cape can create problems. Also very small structures like the horns on the head of the Oni or the arrow sticking into his chest and back can create a little bit of difficulty at times. But you don't have to worry about that too much because if you get the general gesture of a mesh totally there, it doesn't take too much cleanup work in order to sculpt a new horn on the head or to clean up the arrows and make them look even better than they did in clay. For this reason, I actually try to keep my clay sculptures pretty loose unless a client that I'm working with or uh, an artist that I'm collaborating with actually wants to see something in clay super clean and detailed. For this piece, I had entered a contest through Universal Studios um, to design a movie monster in the vein of the old Dracula with Bela Lugosi or Frankenstein or Creature from the Black Lagoon. So in that vein, I had uh, attempted to do an Oni monster from Japanese folklore. I had noticed that many of the movie monsters from that era generally were European based except for, of course, uh, the mummy, uh, which took place in Egypt in parts of it. So I had liked the idea of taking folklore from a culture that hadn't been used too much to represent uh, horror and perhaps sadness or misunderstanding. What I really love about those old Universal movies is how much 
of uh, morality there is. They're not just a monster movie. The monsters are never just mindless killing machines. They always have some sort of a pathos to them that makes them interesting. But for the purpose of this video, it is rather important to note that for this particular mask, you saw it right there, I bypassed where not all of an arrow was fully um, um, fully uh, sectioned off under the red part of the masking system. And, you know, at this point, I had resigned myself that there were plenty of things that were going to have to be resculpted, namely the feet, which had crumbled a bit. Uh, as you saw from the beginning of the video when they were perfectly sculpted to this part, I had actually cut the base away. The base was made out of um, insulation pink foam, uh, which is a uh, common material used in a lot of um, uh, miniature terrain. And I've been using it lately as a cheap alternative to wood bases, especially with how frequently that I'll make a sculpture in a wood base and then eventually rip it out to repurpose it somewhere else or to recycle the clay. Um, after You can only drill so many holes in a piece of wood before you're stuck throwing it out. So I didn't want to have to go to that route here. So I did the original piece all in pink foam, which I then painted black. And then in order to scan it, this particular piece had um, uh, one, two, it had four um, different characters in it. So I wasn't able to do the photogrammetry in 3DF Zephyr with all of the characters still on the same base. So I had to cut away and in the process damage the feet. Um, so I did end up re-sculpting the feet, the horns, the tusks, as well as the leather straps on the brooch of the cape and the arrows in the chest and back. And I even gave some extra details. Um, there's some bits, you know, art being a revision sort of a process, um, I added some details in the 3D version um, that you'll see in just a minute here or so that was not in the original sculpture. And uh, I'll give a turnaround so maybe you can spot the differences. But I highly recommend for anyone that's a traditional sculptor looking to get into 3D modeling and sculpting, the most important thing to keep in mind is that you're gonna want to be patient. If you're dealing with 80 or more photos, it can be a little tedious, so you'll wanna make sure that you really take your time to mask off those backgrounds and the base to not interfere um, with what the program is trying to establish as the model mesh. One other tip that I think about and put a lot of effort into is making sure that the background, when I take these pictures, is a white wall and making sure, um, if I can, that the base itself is either a solid white or a solid black. It just makes it easier for the program to do what it needs to do. Um, and even lighting helps. The elimination of as many shadows as you can helps the program to get the right uh, proportions and the right um, geometry together for the final mesh. And this turnaround is the final result. You can see how with a little bit of modeling, the mesh has lots of details in the muscles and the face and the tusks and even the horns. If you found this video helpful, like and subscribe and next time we'll prep this model for 3D printing.